Hello, my name is Steve O'Neill, and I am the Executive Director of Earthshine Nature Programs, a small 501c3 nonprofit organization based in the mountains of Western North Carolina, USA, planet Earth. What do we do? Well, here's a taste. Part of our mission is to connect you with misunderstood wildlife and nature, such as these turtles and tortoises behind me. Almost all of the animals that we have in our nature center are misunderstood creatures that have been either injured by humans, by their encounters with humans, such as lawnmowers, car accidents, things like that, or they were ex-pets. Many of these box turtles and tortoises were ex-pets. At our facility in the mountains of Western North Carolina, we give our animals a wonderful home, a forever home. And these animals also then become education ambassadors for their species, and they then can teach others about the wonders of nature and wildlife. Many of the animals we bring to you are very misunderstood, such as this ball python named Fiona. And um, sometimes we've even been known to put chickens on our heads. You might ask why though? Well, for one, it's fun. And for another thing, we need to know where our food comes from. So what better way than to raise a flock of chickens? And then our students and our volunteers and our interns all get to meet them and learn how awesome these animals are and, of course, where our food comes from. So part of where our food comes from involves gardening. And so here we have the organic garden planted by my students and I and look at the production. We've had quite good results over the last two years of our organic gardening experiment. And it's doing very well this year. Lots of beans, lots of tomatoes, and some rather monster squash. Look at that beautiful homegrown organic sun ripened tomato. Mm. This year, one of my interns, Pierce Curran of Scaly Adventures mm. fame, built this incredible bean tunnel. Look at this. It's just crazily producing so many green beans. And Pierce named it Pierce's Bean Machine, fittingly. Wow. Another thing we work very hard to teach and promote is a very misunderstood subject, renewable energy. That's right. Behind me you can see several of our solar projects that we've completed over the last few years. And the largest one behind me, our grid tied 4.8 kilowatt array powers our building and it powers my car. My car is a 2012 Nissan Leaf right there behind me. It's plugged in and charging via this level two Clipper Creek charging station. This charging station gets its energy from the solar array that I just showed you. That's right. My car, that little blue car behind me, is powered by the sun. It gets its fuel from the sun. That is just amazing. That's incredible science. And you know what? Anyone can drive a car powered by the sun or wind or water, renewable energy. 
This is another one of the big themes that I teach here at Earthshine Nature Programs. I teach that we need to end our addiction to fossil fuels and we need to focus on cleaner choices of energy such as electric vehicles powered by renewable energy. It's here, it is now, it is today. Clay is an eastern box turtle and Clay was born with a deformity in his shell that does not allow him to close it like a normal box turtle. Clay is just one of the many unique animals that I have here at the Earthshine Nature Programs Nature and Science Center. And I take Clay and many of these animals on the road to outreach programs, bringing them to you so that you can learn about these animals and how, how to respect them better and how to understand them and just let them live. So as you can see, working as naturalist and executive director of Earthshine Nature Programs, well, it forces me to wear many hats. And I, I love the challenge because it means bringing some amazing stories to you here on Patreon and of course, all over the internet via my YouTube series, the Earthshine Nature Programs YouTube site. These stories are gonna encompass all kinds of things from renewable energy, gardening, chickens, and of course, misunderstood wildlife, such as some of those that you have met in this short video. All of the unique projects that my students and I work on are focused on sustainability, respecting nature, and making a better future for all of us. So building a better future, that's what we're bringing to you. Ways that you can work to lower your carbon footprint, reduce your impact on the earth, and monitor nature to help you understand what's going on around you and help protect you from some of the problems of today's world. Such as behind me, take a look. This is a purple air monitor. It's made by a company called Purple Air, purpleair.com. And we, re we installed this almost two years ago on our classroom to monitor the particulate matter in the air. Now the particulate matter is what is harmful to our bodies. So the Purple Air Monitor, along with all of our other monitoring equipment, sends their information to the internet where we can then visualize what's going on around us in nature. Take a look at the Purple Air Monitor's output. So as you can see, our air quality is 38. That's pretty good. Could be a lot worse, like it is in California. And if you had an air monitor such as this, you would be able to keep track of your air. And I will teach you how to do that through my videos. This is Mission Control. It shows us all of our systems, lets us see the output of our solar array. 3600 watts at the moment. It trends over time. As well as camera systems that let us monitor what's going on around the classroom and nature center and garden area. The inside of a very unique project, a chicken nest box car, if you want to call it that. We'll go take a look at that in a minute. The live feed from our weather station. So this is our classroom. Your support will help us make our classroom better. It will help us teach misunderstood wildlife and nature topics as well as misunderstood science topics to the next generation. This is our seating area. And I know it's very unique. It's made from recycled Nissan Leaf electric vehicle seats. These seats were donated by Bob Harris of Black Bear Solar Institute in Tennessee. So not only did Bob Harris donate the seats from the used Nissan LEAF electric vehicles, but he also donated an entire car. Yeah, that's right, right behind me, that entire Nissan LEAF was donated by Bob Harris of Black Bear Solar Institute. And what is it, you may ask? Well, let's take a look. Okay, so my students and I took this donated vehicle that can no longer be driven on the roads. We removed the front seats and used them for our theater system. And then we turned the car into a nesting coop for the chickens. That's right, this is our small, small flock of egg laying hens. And we just recently completed some work on the coop car as we call it. Let's take a look. So when you open the door, you will see a nest box. When the chickens start laying very soon, they will be able to lay in these boxes. There's another back here. They may even want to use the glove box as a place to nest. That's why I've left it open. 
Couldn't get easier than that. Here at Earthshine Nature Programs, we focus heavily on the ethics of reduce, reuse, recycle, rethink, and repurpose. Speaking of repurpose, take a look at the chicken coop. This is the primary chicken coop. This is where the chickens spend the night so that they don't get eaten by predators. This coop is very unique. It's circular for one thing. The walls are chain link fence, repurposed chain link fence. May not be pretty, but it works. The ceiling, take a look up there. The ceiling is a repurposed 1980s era satellite dish. That's right. It was just standing in the forest and we brought it over here and turned it into the roof of the chicken coop. So one of the unique features of this chicken coop is the automatic feeder. When the automatic feeder is triggered by a 12 volt timer, it raises, exposing the food. See down here, we have a metal bucket. This keeps the food covered and away from rodents uh, while the chickens are not eating. But when it's time to eat, the bucket will start to raise, a bell will sound, and the chickens will come running. Let's test it out. This is the timer control system. So it's a really unique system that the students and I built that helps protect the food from rodents. Also, it helps protect the chickens because at night, if the food's covered up, it won't smell and attract predators as much as it would if it was just exposed. Now, as soon as the sun goes down and the chickens are back home, another timer turns on another actuator which lowers this door, keeping predators from coming into the coop after all the chickens are back home safely. So another one of the R's that we focus on here at Earthshine Nature Programs is wildlife rehabilitation. We have many projects going on most of the time and right now take a look at just a few of the ones from this summer. Hello everybody. Well, the last couple of weeks have been really busy in the area of wildlife rescue and rehabilitation. So let's take a look at a few clips from the last few rescues and see how they're doing. So I'm on my way to rescue a timber rattlesnake. That's right, a timber rattlesnake. Uh, this little guy got himself into a situation where he was too close to a residential home uh, where folks had a cat, and not only that, but they were outside quite a bit gardening and such, and so, well, you know, a rattlesnake in that situation could be very dangerous to the people, the animals, and of course, to his own life. So I'm going to pick him up right now um, after the landowner has put him under a uh, restraining uh, device, basically uh, an upside down bucket. And uh, I'm gonna catch him, put him in a bucket, and then taking, uh, take him a short distance away to where I can release him without um, having to harm him or the people uh, where he was on the land which he was found. So let's check out this little rattlesnake and um, see if we can give him a hand. Okay, so I am here to pick up the snake. This is the uh, bucket I was talking about that uh, the landowner put down over the snake. And um, so, with my tools, I'm going to hopefully, hopefully this will go nice and smooth, put the snake in this bucket, and then place the top over, and then we'll be done. So let's see what we have under this bucket. behind me here. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's no snake. All right.
right, so take a look. <laughs> yeah, was just a minute ago we flipped this over and obviously there was no snake. That was a little bit disturbing. Typically they can't get out from under something like this, but this one did. Apparently it wiggled its way out. Um, but then I got to looking around and, uh, well, look over here. It's right down there. Yeah, sure. So it's, uh, apparently it did escape and it crawled down here. Uh, underneath this, uh, this propane. Little propane tank. All right, so now it's time to catch the snake. So um, here we go. Let's see what we can do. There it is. It's a young snake. You can see there's a lot of taper on its rattle, so it's not a very old. Not a very old snake at all, and I'm uh, from the length of the tail. I'm going to say it's a male. All right, we're going to put him in here. I don't want to support him too long on the tongs. That can be a little bit. It can be damaging if you do it too long. And that's how it's done. Now I'm going to tote this snake to a remote location, not too far from here, but far enough to where hopefully it will never come back. <laughs> okay, so I've brought the snake about four miles away from the capture location, uh, four miles straight line distance. And I'm deep in the forest, away from uh, areas of high human activity. And I have found a nice little area of some rocky outcrops with really great hiding spots, lots of down timber in, uh, in some areas here. Uh, and I feel like this is a, a, good, a good spot to release the snake to give it at least a chance at survival. Now we know that moving timber rattlesnakes very far from their home range is never a good practice, but when the only other option is death, uh, there's no other option. So hopefully the snake will be able to adapt to this new environment. Uh, I know this area has a, a good number, a good population of native timber rattlesnakes, so hopefully it will be able to integrate itself into that population without too much difficulty. So let's go ahead and release this beautiful snake. Okay, let me get a picture first before I let him go. So I've taken several images, and if the uh, landowner ever sees this snake again, we will hopefully be able to identify it by its markings. You know, rattlesnake's markings are basically just like our fingerprints. They are unique to each animal. Okay, we're going to let him go. Put him down here. Where he can crawl up under the log if he wants to. And of course he wants to. It's a safe place. Give him a chance to recover from his ordeal last night. Being captured and then kept under a bucket. And then captured again. You can tell he's young because of the incredible taper on his rattle. All right, little guy. Well, that's it for you. Good luck. If I was a rattlesnake and I had the choice of living in someone's backyard where uh, traumatic experiences would happen or living here in this beautiful forest, I think I would pick the latter. But I hope he can see it the same way I do. I hope he can adapt. All right, so I just picked up an injured eastern box turtle from a man who found it in the road after it had been hit by a car. And uh, we're going to investigate its shell. It has a pretty bad shell fra fracture and uh, then patch the fracture. So let's take a look at the turtle now. And so here's the little turtle. He was hit by a car. You can see how his carapace was fractured here. And uh, if you flip him over, we'll look at his belly. You can see along the 
um, here is the hinge and right above the hinge is the bridge and you can see how it's crushed and uh, so what we're gonna have to do is rotate him back down is we're gonna have to put a strap that will support his shell over this direction from the top from the pla uh, from the carapace then around to the bottom to the to the plastron to hold everything in place while it heals that uh, yellowish substance coming out of the crack is antibiotic ointment so let's do this okay so we have finished applying the uh, shell patch uh, we've done three separate layers to hold everything together but still allow drainage um, out through the front crack and then down here on the bottom there's it's hard to see it but there's an area where it can drain here and in the back and uh, we're letting it set up now and we may actually need to add another layer of epoxy soon but we'll determine that after this is hardened fully okay so we've patched the shell we weren't able to actually film that because there's only two of us and we needed all of our hands to do the work. The shell's been patched. Um, underneath this tape is a layer of uh, flexible fiberglass material and then over top of that is some epoxy. And it's a, a clear epoxy that will, it's not permanent because this is a young turtle. He's still growing actively, he or she. It's, it's hard to tell if it's male or female right now, it's so young. And uh, after the, the glue hardens under here, I will peel the tape away and we'll be able to see the, uh, the actual shell patch. I may, need, I may need to add some more glue later. Uh, and we'll determine that as time goes on. But he's gonna have to keep this patch on his shell for several years as uh, it heals. It's gonna take a long time for this to heal, but you can see he's really a very active young turtle. Um, I did not patch all the way up to the front because we need to be able to get uh, antibiotic ointment in there. Um, and, and let things drain as needed. There's, a, there's also the crack up here. It's, it's going to be allowed to drain through this area once we remove the tape. Uh, but we may need to patch this later. That's a really bad injury, and it will heal. It's just going to take a lot of time. So he's a lucky little guy or girl. All right. So this is one of the three baby possums that we rescued recently. They're almost ready to go back into the wild. I think this is Monkey. Isn't this Monkey? Uh, yes. This, I thought so. He's the, He's the biggest. He's definitely the biggest. And these three little babies were rescued by a very nice man in the area here who found their mother. She'd been hit by a car and these little guys are the only survivors. They were much smaller when we got them. They're doing much better now, as you can see. Oh, there we go. That's and, Pokey. Yeah, there's Pokey. And Pokey and Monkey and Princess, they were the only, all the, ugh. These are the only three from, these are the only three Joeys from the litter that the uh, sad, unfortunate uh, mother had in her pouch. Um, well, the only three that survived. The only three that survived, yeah. I'm having trouble coming up with words because they're just so cute. Uh, here we go. Look how cute. I hope they have good balance, too. <laughs> oh, they're possums. They have excellent balance. Oh, you are so sweet. Hey there. Little baby opossums. Now, in this country, they're called opossums, and if you go down under into Australia and New Zealand, they're called possums without the O. Very sweet. <laughs> oh, he's going to bite your nose. I'm going to have to laugh. Oh, slip. I hope they don't slip. I can't catch them. Oh, no, they'll hold on. They're, they're very good at holding on. Well, it's not like I'm a tree. <laughs> They're very grippy little creatures. Grippy. Yeah. You grippy. No, 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 no. Back up. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll him. spot him. You got him? Okay, here we go. Come on. There we go. I'll put you up. Now let's take a look at the last one, Princess. 
This is the little Joey we're calling Princess. She's the smallest, and we were really worried about her once we when we first received her. She was very tiny, and we had a lot of trouble getting her to eat, but now she's eating everything in sight. And uh, she's a little behind in her development, but she's going to be just fine. And very soon, um, all three of them we're going to put into a uh, cage out in the forest and let them basically get used to hearing night sounds, day sounds. Uh, they're going to be left alone. We're not going to touch them and let them uh, become acclimated to life in the forest. And then after a couple of weeks, um, we will open the doors of the cage and let them go on about their way. But we will leave food out and water out for several weeks until they stop coming around. The way we're going to know if they're uh, still coming around or not is we're going to keep um, I'm going to keep set up a camera, a motion-activated uh, game camera, and once there's no more possums, then we'll be finished. How cute they are! Oh, that was a big yawn. <laughs> Very cute. She's licking me. Come here. Come here. Take your little bath. So what Marion's having to do is wipe her little bum, her little rear end, so that it will stimulate her to defecate and urinate. Um, because this is exactly how a mama possum would do. She would lick it, uh, lick its little rear, to get it to use the bathroom. Um, because the little baby doesn't have that capability yet. There we go. Good girl. You done? She got a little, little pee, tiny little bits of poop. Good. Okay. And now it's time to feed this little cute thing. Oh my. She's just licking her finger. That's good. Yep. At least she's here. Here. How cute. Oh, you're getting it all over your face. Getting it all over her face. Okay, and all over me. Mm-hmm. Good girl. What are you doing? So as I said, we've had her about two weeks, and uh, she has grown substantially. Her hair is filling out more. We figured she was born around the 1st of February. Mm-hmm. She still does not eat on her own. She'll mouth food and she'll play with it. She loves bananas, but uh, she doesn't really know how to eat yet other than licking and sucking. So it won't be long though. She'll start eating solid food, um, hopefully really soon. Her face. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Oh, what a messy little possum. She loves that, though. What she's eating is a mixture of kitten formula and a special prescription dog and cat emergency food called AD. It's given to dogs and cats when they're really in a stressed out situation. Maybe they've been injured and uh, veterinarians use it. Oh, my gosh. What a mess. And some banana in it. And some banana. And she loves banana. We'll give her a piece in a minute. <laughs> Look at the mess you made. What a messy little possum. Look. You eat that? See that? Oops. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
messy little possum. She loves banana, as you can see. And she's so much stronger and healthier than she was when we first found her. She was practically on death's door when we found her. Or I should say when the folks who rescued her found her. And then called me, and I picked her up. She looks like she's about to fall asleep. Uh -huh. <laughs> He's barely licking right now. Oh, there he comes. You're waking up again. <laughs> Are you looking for more? Do you have another little piece? I do. <laughs> Look at that. There you go. Look. Look. Ooh. No. Oh, oh you're going to lose it. No. There we go. <laughs> Look at her. She's actually working it. I think she's figuring it out here. How to chew. Well, no, she's more of more still she's sucking. Sucking yeah, it up. She's into sucking her mouth. it into her mouth instead of biting pieces off. Although her teeth aren't really fully formed yet, she's they're starting to erupt a little bit. I want a copy of this video to show my class. Mm -hmm. Sure. Very cute. Be real still. Well, she won't look up. She's just totally like... back towards me. Oh, that's good, actually. Very cute. Grab it in your little hands. <laughs> She's learning. Learning how to eat. Let her go. Not quite. Yeah, she's still kind of understanding kinda, how to pick the food right. up and hold it. And she still jams her nose into it more than she bites it. Uh huh. There, see, she's sucking it like like sucking up milk. <laughs> can, you can probably hear it. Mm hmm. That's so cute. I would assume she's probably getting some good banana juice. Meanwhile, her face is covered in food. Just let you know how good it is. Mm -hmm. Your hands are covered in food is funny. Of course, every time we feed her, we get absolutely covered in food, just like she does. And then she gets to spend a while cleaning herself off. Which, of course, is education for her, so that she can learn how to groom herself. Oh, she loves that. <laughs> I know, it's so cute. Did you she, drop it? Where'd it go? There it is. She loves that banana. Of course, you know, possums do have a sweet tooth, so... Here comes our little possum. I mean dog. You're dropping mm -hmm. it. Oh, there it is. It's in her mouth. Look. Oh, look. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> she has AD all over her face. Yeah. Look at that. That is the funniest thing. She's just trying her best to, to suck that into her mouth like milk. <laughs> Good training, though. Good girl. <laughs> I think she's sleeping. Yeah. How sleepy she is. Uh, well, it is. You know, it is her nighttime right now. 
It's exhausting to have to. Look at her doing like kitty biscuits, kind of how cats do when they're nursing. I wonder if possums do the same thing. I bet they do. Yeah, probably to stimulate the mother to produce more milk. Are you trying to wipe it off your face? There we go. Mm -hmm. Slurp, slurp. Did you get it? Oh, she's still sucking it. You can't see her anymore. Oh, I'm going to spill this over. She really wants that last little bit. Mm -hmm. Doesn't want to lose right there. it. It's right there. It's right there. Look. Here it is. Her. Oh my gosh, look at her go. Possum biscuits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of tickles. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got it all, baby. There's a tiny little bit left. Right there. She's covered in, in food. It's so funny. <laughs> She's so after that banana. Look at my little grabby paws. Mm -hmm. She must still have a tiny little bit in her mouth that she's gumming. Yeah. Looks that Can way. Can you see her mouth moving? Uh-huh. She really wants. Yeah, it's so cute. And so sad that her mama was killed. But we'll do our best to get her up, to raise her up until she's ready to be released, and then we'll let her go near where she was found. Okay, bedtime again. You're about to fall asleep. <laughs> I think she is. All right, you go in here and groom and go to sleep, okay? Nap time. Now she's going to groom herself, clean her little feet, and we'll leave her alone. Come back and feed her in another couple of hours. Okay, this is Pharaoh. He has a very bad case of scale rot on his belly, probably caused by thermal burn and mouth rot. And we're treating him ever since yesterday when we first got him back. This is how his belly looks right now. We cleaned away all of the, the dead and rotten scales that we could and the scabs. And you can still see he has a lot of the blistering on a lot of the scales that we have to be careful not to, to bust the blisters. Um, we're soaking him in iodine, yeah. I mean, betadine. yeah, betadine bath. You can see where his vent is, it's very scabbed. Those scales are rotted right at the edge of his vent. He was so badly sick that he was at, at the time we got him back, he was trying to shed, but I had to start helping him shed. And I realized when I did that, that he had three to four shed layers underneath that he never was able to successfully shed. So we had to shed all of that for him and we pretty much got all of that 
off now and he's looking much prettier than he did. And he's certainly able to move around better than he was. But as you can see, his mouth is, is definitely affected. Yeah. He's drinking, but we haven't yet tried to, to feed him anything. We're going to start him on injectable antibiotics as well as we're coating him uh, with a topical antibiotic uh, every day and giving him a warm soak every day. And really, he does look a lot better than just 24 hours ago. Mostly because we've removed all of the dead tissue that was all over his belly. Yeah. But he's not moving around normally or anything yet. No. And all of his blisters. I mean, there's, he has hundreds of blisters all over his belly. Yeah, they're terrible. They're filled with pus. And all of these areas were rotted so deeply and they had made huge scabs. Some of those came off when we, when we peeled all of those three and four layers of shed away. Yeah, it's really sad. So if you get a pet snake, be sure you do your research and know the requirements of the snake, its habitat, before you do anything like this. I mean, I should say before you get a pet snake so that this will not happen. Right. And this probably just happened because... Someone didn't didn't monitor the temperature of his uh, heating pad on and the I, bottom of the cage, yeah. and it ended up burning his belly all, a, pretty much all along the length. Right. And what I think happened was the heating pad malfunctioned and got hotter than it was supposed to. And uh, he was laying on the heating pad because it was the warmest spot in the tank. If he moved off of that, he would get Sorry. cool. So he had no choice if he wanted to be warm but lay on the warm area above the heating pad and since it was malfunctioning he didn't move because he needed the heat but see snakes interpret heat differently than we do and he didn't know that he needed to move okay it's time for your iodine bath yep so we've put him in a 10 gallon aquarium with about three and a half inches of water um, and the water has in it some betadine solution. We mix it up to where it's about the, con the color of wheat tea. And that gives it about the right concentration for killing germs but not harming the animal. We'll stay in there about an hour. A little medicated sauna. So behind me you can see two of the other very unique projects that my students and I have constructed here at Earthshine Nature Programs. Not only is there a solar charged golf cart that never needs to be plugged in, but behind it is a solar charging station located in a field on top of a mountain in the middle of the wilderness. This charging station is primarily for staff at the school where I work as full-time science educator. I'll do a full length video on how this charging station works, but in a nutshell, it uses small solar panels from the same uh, repurposed Nissan Leaf electric vehicles uh, to charge a 12 volt battery. This 12 volt deep cycle battery is used to provide power 24 seven to radio chargers and USB, USB plugs. This allows the wilderness staff here at our wilderness school, Trails Carolina, to 
keep their communications devices fully charged, such as my very own radio here. And that's how it works. So it's wonderful projects like these that rely on renewable energy as their primary energy source. These are the type of projects we work on here at Earthshine Nature Programs in our science classes. So your support will help us create more of these amazing energy projects that show that we do not need to depend on fossil fuels to power our lives. So with your support, we will be able to continue to bring to you unique videos following all of the projects we are working on here at Earthshine Nature Programs. Currently, our number one project is phase two of our solar array. Phase two consists of extending the solar panels to the east and to the west to cover the entire south side of the building behind me. We have funded a large portion of phase two, but we still need more support. We have started preliminary construction. Just the other day, we removed a window to get ready to make space for hanging some of the components that will work to make phase two functional. Here are a few images from that day. Our good friend and, and uh, Earthshine Nature Program's primary supporter, Jim Hardy, came out and helped us install boards to cover up an old window that was not really ever being used. And that space is now gonna be used to, to hold a lot of the support systems and electronic equipment that will allow phase two to tie into phase one of our solar power system and power the building 100 or more percent and also power my car with electric fuel generated from the sun. So please consider supporting us today with Patreon or even our GoFundMe campaign or a direct donation. You can find the links to my website in the description. You can see all we're working on and please help us out. Help us make all of this amazing happen for the future. And you know, that's all we have. All we have is the future. So we need to make our future the best we can be, the best we can make it through technology, science, and understanding of nature and wildlife so that we can all live together in peace and make a better future for all of us. You know, and I know you're hearing some interesting sounds in the background while I'm uh, narrating here. What you're hearing are my students. My students are playing basketball across the, the way there through the forest. And this is all about them. It's not about us. It's about them. It's about the next generation and then their kids and their kids' kids. That's why I do this. I want them to have a better world than we did. So please, let's make that happen together. Thank you. Okay, so that's just a little taste of what we do here at Earthshine Nature Programs. I hope that what you've seen will inspire you to support us with your contributions. We will make more videos. We will make more change. We will make a better future through education and inspiration. We will help wildlife. We will do science. And we will use all of these things to make a better world for all of us. Time to pick some squash.
we just look at that beautiful tomato. <laughs> So as you can see here at Earthshine Nature Programs, as the executive director, I run, I wear a mitten. And sometimes we've even been known to put chickens on our heads. <laughs> she really likes it up there. <laughs> so as you can see, I wear many hats here at Earthshine Nature Programs literally and figuratively because there's a lot to be done there's a lot to educate there's a lot a lot there's a lot of uh, there's a, yeah.